from Nehemiah 9. Stand up, blessed be the Lord your God, from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You, Lord, are the only God. You created the heavens, the highest heavens with all their stars, the earth that is all, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You give life to all of them, and all the stars of heaven worship you. You, the Lord, are the God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and changed his name to Abraham. You found his heart faithful in your sight and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, Hethites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites to give it to his descendants. You have fulfilled your promise, for you are righteous. Will you, play, will you pray with me? Lord, thank you that in your perfect design and providence, we have in your written word all we need to know and follow you. Thank you for this example of confession and praise from your people. We too come before you now in recognition and confession of our sin, and we too come before you in wonder of your fulfilled promises. Thank you that we have the full story in your word, that while we were dead in sin, you made us alive through Jesus' death and resurrection. May you give us hearts that respond in joyful worship. We pray now for spirit-led words from Pastor Jeff. May you bless him this morning, and may you open our hearts to hear. In the name of Jesus, our Savior and Lord, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The reason why we wanted to start with that scripture today is because that scripture in Nehemiah 9 is the last song in the Old Testament that is actually praising God for accomplishing what the people and judges right now in the texts that we're dealing with in this book were struggling with. They were struggling with taking the land, securing it, and here, Nehemiah is leading some people back to the land after their exile in Babylon and Persia, and they have the land. And they've rebuilt their worship system and their temple and their city. And so it is the fulfillment of something that God had promised them. And these songs can be very, very powerful ways of commemorating all that God has done. Uh, I want to just give you some of the lyrics to another song you may Recognize this, you may not. Uh, some of the words go like this. Oh, say, can you see? By the dawn's early light, what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, or oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming. And the rocket's red glare, the bomb bursting in air, gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave? Oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. I can see some of you mouthing the words. How do you know that song? How do you know it? Two things, repetition and the melody. We've sung it enough times in our culture to just know the song. And the tune is very memorable. It's very memorable such that it sticks in our minds. Of all the national anthems in the world today, it is generally agreed that the Star-Spangled Banner is the most notoriously difficult to sing. And you, you've all seen these people when, when its words are not botched or flubbed, but instead performed to perfection by the likes of a Jennifer Hudson or Faith Hill or the late, great Whitney Houston or my favorite, Chris Stapleton. Yeah. Amen, brah. <laughs> when you hear these people sing that song, it just gives you chills, right? And I realize the anthem is a flashpoint of controversy today for some due to the third stanza. There's a line in the third stanza that recognizes the devastation on everyone the war had, particularly the hirelings and the slaves. By the way, no one ever sings that third stanza. But I think we could all agree that the song wasn't intended to cure everything that ails our culture. It's a song, and as such, it enshrines the story of America's victory over British tyranny, and it gives us a window. It gives us, future generations, a window, a glimpse into the world that was at the time. It was written. The Star-Spangled Banner is classified technically in the genre of a, as a hymn of triumph, a triumph hymn. 
It's a genre of historical songs that uses poetry to commemorate significant victories in cultures. Now, triumph hymns are, or national anthems are much older than you might think. In fact, these songs go all the way back to the beginning of human civilization and are well attested in the ancient Near East, commemorating the victors of the likes of Tutmos III or Ramses II or Minerta or Tukulti, Ninurta, Tiglath, Pileser, or Shamanes of the Third. These ancient victory hymns follow the historical narratives of their victories. And so we see these kinds of anthems all over the Old Testament, beginning with Exodus chapter 15 and the Song of Moses after God had drowned the Egyptians in the sea. In chapter 19, he, he, he sings another song. We see the women of Israel sing of David's victories after he strikes down the Philistines in 1 Samuel 18. David himself bursts into praise at God's victory over the house of Saul in 2 Samuel 22. All of Israel breaks into song after returning to their land under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, as we just read in Nehemiah chapter 9. And so these victory hymns give expression to the joy and the relief, to the grief and the wonder and the gratitude we feel for all that God has accomplished on our behalf. And today, I have just eight quick points <laughs> from our text. If you're following along with your bulletin, number one, the song of Deborah in chapter five, Judges chapter five, praises God for his intervention. It praises God for being the one who intervenes on their behalf. Verse 1 says, on that day, Deborah and Barak, son of Abinoam, sang. When the leaders led in Israel, when the people volunteer, blessed be the Lord. Listen, kings, pay attention, princes. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Lord, when you come from Seir, when you came from Seir, when you marched from the fields of Edom, the earth trembled, it shook, the skies poured forth rain, and the clouds poured water, and the mountains just dissolved. The mountains melted before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. And so the song pulls back the curtain to show us just how the victory in chapter 4 was achieved. Deborah and Barak addressed the song to Israel's God. Israel's God is Yahweh, the God of Israel. That's his name. And while the term God, the Hebrew word for that is the word Elohim, is a generic term for any deity, any deity or supernatural being. Sometimes it's used of supernatural beings. You and I tend to think of angels or the heavenly hosts and that type of thing. Sometimes it uses this word El Elohim to actually describe them as well. But the name Yahweh is his specific designation. It occurs about 700 times in the Old Testament, and when coupled with the word Elohim, it occurs about 365 times, the Lord our God. And so the name includes all three tenses, the word Yahweh, and includes all three tenses in the Hebrew language. I'm the one who was, I'm the one who is, and I'm the one who is going to be. And so when God tells Moses, this is the name you should tell Pharaoh, this is the God who is sending you. You tell him, I am sent you. In other words, you tell him the one who is, as opposed to all these who are not, sent you. So Israel's theology here is reflected many centuries later in that hymn we just read in Nehemiah 9. Let's look at it again. Verses 5 through 8, it says, Blessed be the Lord your God. There it is again, Yahweh Elohim. From everlasting to everlasting, this stresses the Jewish doctrine of God's eternality. God has no beginning, and he's the only thing in all of existence who has no beginning. And blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. The word glory in Hebrew means weight. You ever seen one of those stories where you're coming across a story and God's glory appears and everybody just hits the floor? It's because God's presence is powerful. And when you come into the full rays of it, you hit the ground. And this idea is that God is a glorious God, and you, you Lord, are the only God. Emphasizes Mo Moses' uh, teaching in the Shema. There is one God of Israel. Hear, O Israel, there is one Lord, and he is our Lord. 
And this Lord created the heavens, the highest heavens with all the stars, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You are the one who gives life to all of them and all the stars of heaven worship you. You, the Lord, Yahweh Elohim, the Lord, our God, who chose our father, Abram. And so singing our praises to God and singing them rightly to God reminds us of all that he has done for us. We begin by dressing, addressing him, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your name is holy. Your name is righteous. You are the one true God of the universe. And when we sing praises to God, it reminds us of all that he has done for us to intervene on our behalf. Why is that so important? I don't know if you've noticed this yet. But life is full of bad news, isn't it? Isn't it? From cradle to the grave. Life is full of bad news. And in the midst of our despair, we need hope. And when we sing the praises of the Lord God, when we sing the praises of his son, his one and only son, we are reminding ourselves of our hope in the midst of our despair. There is only one other praise song in this book. The book of Judges. You know where it is. It's Judges chapter 16. You know who sings it? The Philistines. The Philistines praise Dagon, their false god Dagon, for delivering Samson into their hands. So here we have a pretty bleak book. And right here, right in the middle of it, right here at the beginning, we see this song of worship that reminds Israel, no matter how bleak things get, no matter how despairing your condition becomes, the God of the universe is your God. And look what he has done for you. In Acts chapter 16, Luke tells a story that illustrates this. Paul is out preaching with his friend, Silas, who is his travel companion, and they get thrown into jail. They're just walking along. They're trying to preach. They're, they're in Asia. And they're trying to preach in Ephesus. And someone comes up to them. It's a little girl. It's a girl. She comes up to them, and she starts interrupting their preaching. And she's saying things like, listen to these men. They're spokesmen for the, for, the, for the most high God. And she keeps interrupting them. And Paul discerns in his spirit that she's demon-possessed. He discerns that she's demonized. And so the scripture says, agitated in spirit, he turned and cast the demon out of the young girl. Now, she's a slave girl. She's made a lot of money for her, her owners. Are her owner, owners happy about this? Turns out, no. And so they drag Paul and Silas in front of the magistrates, and they say, these men are advocating foreign gods, and we should throw them into prison. And indeed, they do. They throw them into jail. So they go. And they're sitting in jail. And Luke says about midnight, they begin singing and worshiping and praising the God of heaven. And suddenly the walls in that jail begin to shake and all the gates popped open and all the shackles for all the prisoners fell to the floor and the guy running the prison, sound asleep. He's out, <coughs> kicking back, gone. But when he wakes up and he finds that everyone in that jail has fled, he takes his sword out because he knows what his options are. It's either fall on your sword now or be crucified, which is the most horrible death you can imagine. And so he decides to kill himself. But Paul and Silas haven't gone anywhere. I would have ran. And they call out to him, don't kill yourself. And they share the gospel with them. And this man and his household, they get saved. They come to faith in Jesus. Now, you kind of read that story in the book of Acts and you think, well, they just sort of took it in stride. They were unfazed by their time in jail. Why? Because they were powerful men of the gospel, and they just worshiped the Lord. But now look at how Paul describes it to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 1.8. He says, of the afflictions we experienced in Asia, we were so utterly burdened beyond our ability to endure that we despaired life itself. Paul says that was our psychology, <laughs> like that was our, that was our thinking at this time. When we were going through these kinds of trials, we despaired, we thought life isn't even worth living. That's how he felt. Now, this is what he knows. 
2 Corinthians 4, 8, and 17, we are afflicted. Sure, it's true. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. We are struck down, but not destroyed. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. That's what Paul knows. That's not how he feels, but that's what he knows. And so the book of Judges is oddly interrupted with this praise song. The only praise song in the book to God. This dark and bleak time in their history, in their story. 31 verses of enthusiastic praise and celebration for all that God had accomplished for them. I think it is right and good to praise the Lord. No matter what you're going through. No matter what situation you're facing. Lift your praises to the God of the universe. Number two, the song recalls the deplorable conditions of Israel, verses 6 through 8. In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the main roads were deserted because travelers kept to the side roads. Villages were deserted. They were deserted in Israel until I, Deborah, arose, a mother in Israel. Israel chose new gods, and then there was war at the gates. That is always what happens. When you choose the wrong gods, it brings conflict. And not a shield or spear was seen among 40,000 in Israel. They are hopelessly, utterly outmatched. So what Deborah is describing is a country in lockdown. Remember that? During the time of Shamgar and Jael, the Canaanite marauders made it dangerous to travel on highways, which negatively impacted commercial trading, their social life, their worship life, most of all. The Canaanite raiders constantly disrupted agricultural agriculture, causing crops and fields to be abandoned. They threatened unwalled and thus unprotected villages and towns. And this continued until Deborah rose up. She emerges as a prophetess and a judge. And she comes on the scene and she says, not on my watch. And before they could do so, before they could get out and go to the battle and conscript all of the tribesmen to battle, they have to give up their new gods. They have to give up their new gods. God had sent war and oppression because of their sin and their disloyalty and their idolatry. And they are hopelessly outmatched and overwhelmed and oppressed and impoverished, you name it. They lack all the resources necessary to win this victory that is setting before them. And these conditions are caused by their embrace of idolatrous new gods. Let me ask you, what are the new gods of our culture today? Do you see them every day in the media? I think you do. What are the new gods of our society? Which gods have we embraced? Which gods have we embraced that has brought war to our gates? That has brought conflict, endless, never-ending conflict as people break off into factions and tribes and go to war with each other over every imaginable issue. And we learn from Paul that this is nothing new. In Ephesians 2, he says this, So then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At the time you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenants of promise without hope and without God in the world. What is he reminding them of? Remember what you were. Remember you were pagans and you worship false gods and you, you remember what that brought into your life. Don't forget it. And what Paul is trying to tell them is remember that God saved you by his grace. He has lavished us with mercy and we are reminded of so great a salvation, he has set us on a path of good works which he has prepared in advance for us to do. I love the fact that the song does not whitewash their history. The song recalls the miserable condition of a country in lockdown, unable to trade, unable to, unable to conduct business, unable to worship, and following false gods. Number three, the song celebrates a restoration of commerce. It celebrates a restoration of commerce. Now, this may seem like a small point or maybe even an unspiritual insight, but I assure you, their ability to conduct free exchange in, at every level is biblical and spiritual. 
She says, my heart is with the leaders of Israel. She, she empathizes with them, with the volunteers of the people. Bless the Lord, you who ride on white donkeys, who sit on saddled uh, blankets, and who travel on the road. Give praise. Let them tell, the, tell of the righteous acts of the Lord, the righteous deeds of his villagers in Israel, with the voices of the singers and the watering places. Then the Lord's people went down to the city gates. Following the victory in the battle, what happens? It's this feeling of depression and defeat was replaced with a sense of triumph, enabling travelers to move about freely once again and allowing normal activities to resume. The author expresses empathy towards the volunteers and leaders who displayed immense bra bravery, which led to the restoration of normalcy. Isn't normal good? The song draws our attention to how they kept their stories alive, their story of triumph alive. They did it through songs, the singers, the ladies who would gather at their national wells and their cisterns. Why is this important? Because you don't need to sing songs at the watering holes that everybody stops at if nobody's traveling. Travel has resumed. And so the singers sing the songs and remind the people of the victory. And the travelers can now move about the country freely with no fear of Canaanite cruelty. So instead of gathering at the gates for war <clears throat> or just abandoning, abandoning the city gates altogether, which is where they conducted business in their social life, they gather now to sing their songs. They gather now to praise their God. They gather now to exchange. If you remember back how miserable it was to be locked down during covid some of us would really like to forget it. Businesses boarded up, which led to extreme financial pressure associated with the halting of commerce. Social life became non-existent. No sporting events, no chuckers games, no shopping, no dining out. Most of all, no church attendance, the most important thing. Folks, we were locked down for how long? How long were we locked down? Was it a year? Something like that? Yeah. Did it feel miserable? Weren't you starting to get cabin fever? Wasn't it getting just a little, you were starting to get just a little edgy with people? Yeah, imagine Israel being locked down for 20 years. 20 years under the reign of Jabin and his general Sisera. Imagine the psychological toll this would have taken. Imagine the poverty this would have brought to your towns. No wonder the fields are barren. Imagine this. And now what she says in the song is, now you see these people riding around on their fancy white donkeys, right? I guess that's the Mercedes Benz of the ancient world. And sitting on their multicolored saddle blankets, traveling freely on the road, standing at the cisterns, praising the Lord, breaking out into worship for all that he has done. And I think there's a lesson here for the church, for America. Deborah's song celebrates the restoration of the free market which is based on the principle of voluntary rather than compulsory exchange. Now, the principles of free exchange, land ownership, and fair market value, and the selling of goods, and the practicing of free worship, those things are regulated from Moses' law all the way to Jesus' teaching, Jesus and Paul's teachings. The Ten Commandments and Mosaic legislation regulate the exchange of goods, principles of fairness and free trade permeate biblical stories. The book of Proverbs reserves its harshest judgments. You know who the people in the Old Testament God says, I hate you? The only people God says, I hate, are the people who are cheating people in the markets by, with uh, false scales, price gouging. Did you know that the Proverbs 31 wife, happy Mother's Day, but if you take the time and really carefully look at the Proverbs 31 woman, she is a woman who faithfully and diligently works hard, produces goods, goes down to the market, and sells them. That's the woman of God. After the exile, when Israel finally returns to its land and rebuilds the temple and its city, Nehemiah returns to see, here's what he, here's what he sees. He sees the people in Israel have become so prosperous now, returned to their land, that they are starting to sell on the Sabbath. And for the 
first time in Israel's history, Nehemiah says, you got to shut down the market on the Sabbath, and it begins sundown Friday night. And to this day, it's, the Sabbath is sundown Friday night. It begins. And so understand that they were prosperous. When you go fast forward to the New Testament, Jesus regularly ministered and healed people in the markets. He taught principles of free and fair exchange. For example, he gave the parable, as we noted a couple of weeks ago, of the talents in Matthew 25. He gives one household manager one sum, one talent. He gives another one two. He gives another one three. And what he says is, is you have to reproduce, you have to go out and invest this, and you have to make good on what I've given you. And so the very parable itself presupposes the need for open and free exchange and the investment of capital while also <clears throat> acknowledging the necessity of inequality of outcomes. That's Jesus' parable. The principles of freedom are deeply embedded in both Moses' law and Jesus' teaching. When Jesus says, if the Son sets you free, then you'll be free indeed, everyone there knew what it was like to live under tyranny. When Paul said, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free in Galatians chapter 5, everyone there in Galatia knew what it was like to live under the iron fist of Rome. And so the principles of social and commercial freedom are grounded in the spiritual principles of being set free from our sin and being set free from the devil. And she praises this. She says, this is good and this is right, that life has gone back to normal. Number four, the song commends the participants in the battle. She says, awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, sing a song, arise, Barak, and take your prisoners, son of Ibanoam. And then she goes on to list all the tribes that got off the bench, suited up, and got in the game. And then what she does, if you read it carefully, she curses the tribes like Dan and a few other tribes like Reuben who do not get in the game who didn't come to their aid, who didn't come to help. And so likewise, the gospels, I'm amazed at this. In the New Testament, Old Testament, New Testament, they do not whitewash people's failure. <laughs> they don't. They praise the people who participate, and, they, and she literally curses the people who do not. A curse be upon you and your cities. In Philippians 4.15, Paul praises the Philippians. He says, and you Philippians know that in the early days of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church would touch me with a 10-foot pole. No church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you alone. And he thanks them for their service, and he thanks them for helping them. And then he says to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.15, he says, Paul recalls how everyone uh, in the province of Asia deserted him. He says, everyone in the province of Asia left me, deserted me, especially Phygelus and Hermogenes, those little suckers. He says, everyone except for Onesiphorus. Onesiphorus stayed with me and was willing to die with me. Praise God for Onesiphorus. And it draws our attentions to those who jumped into the fray and those who did not and those who refused to sit this one out and let someone else fight the battle, let someone else do the giving, let someone else do the serving. You never forget the people who came to your aid and you kind of can't forget the people who deserted you. And she does this. It's real. It's on right here in the song. Number five, the song reveals how God threw Sisera's charioteers into confusion. Now, we learned this in chapter four. We learned that he does, but then this song tells us how he does it. It says, kings came and fought, and the kings of Canaan fought at Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo, but they did not plunder the silver. The stars fought from the heavens. The stars fought with Sisera from their past. The river Kishon swept them away. The ancient river, the river Kishon. March on, my soul in strength. She's encouraging herself. And the horse's hooves then hammered the galloping, galloping of his stallions. Curse Miraz, which is a city, says the angel of the Lord. Bitterly curse her inhabitants, for they did not come to help the Lord, to help the Lord with the warriors." So the chariot corps of Canaanites line up for battle. And here's what they do not know. It is a hot, summer, dry day. The ground there is compacted like 
asphalt. And he comes with his 900 chariots, and they pull up to the valley there where they're going to fight right by the Kishon River, and he doesn't know what God is doing behind the scenes. And God is doing two things. First of all, he's causing the stars of heaven to fight against Sisera and his forces. Now, the word star here likely refers to supernatural beings. Sometimes the word star, like Satan's name is Lucifer. That word means the sun of or the morning star, the sun of the dawn or the morning star. And so he doesn't know that these supernatural forces in heavenly places are fighting against him. And he doesn't know that the God of the Hebrews is the God who made the sea, the earth, and the sky, and who controls it. And so right there in the middle of a hot, arid, dry summer, the clouds gather and they start to pour forth rain, the river fills up, and it just washes out on the riverbed, and all their chariots get stuck in the mud. And she says, and the horses galloped, galloped away. (laughs) It's an awesome song. It tells us exactly how God does miracles. He does miracles supernaturally, and he does miracles naturally. God uses natural means, And he is working behind the scenes in the unseen realm to fight on our behalf. And so this is just a powerful scene here that reminds us that God is the one who has thrown the chariot corps of Canaan into this confusion now. God is the one who fought their battle for them. And he used his good world to do it. Listen, the biggest foe you face is no match for the God who created space, time, and matter. For the God who breathed life Breathe life into Adam's nasal passages. That's your God. That's the God who fights for you. Number six, the song commemorates J.L.'s treachery. This is really interesting. Watch this. Most blessed women is Yael, or J.L., the wife of Heber the Kenite. She is most blessed among tent-dwelling women. We got any tent-dwelling women in here? I don't see the Mitchells. Yeah, I, I know at least... Some of you like to tent well. And he asked for water. She gave him milk. She said, I got something better for you. Drink this natural sedative down. (laughs) She brought him cream in a majestic bowl. She reached for a tent peg, her right hand, for a workman's hammer. And then she hammered Sisera. She crushed his head. She shattered and pierced his temple He collapsed, he fell, he lay down between her feet. He collapsed, he fell between her feet. Which is apparently a repeating chorus or something. Uh, Where he collapsed, there he fell, dead. Don't forget what happened to him. So Sisera isn't just killed in battle. He's killed as an act of subterfuge by a supposed family friend. As we learned last week, this makes his death all the more devastating. Why? Why? He not only loses his entire army, his chariots, he dies at the hands of a double agent, a woman of the tents. What does that mean? This means that she is obliged to show him the kind of hospitality, whereas in this Middle Eastern culture, if you invite someone into your home and any harm comes to them, you're in trouble in this culture. And so their standing rule is you would give your life guest (laughs) <laughs> right? So that's a big deal in the ancient Near East in this world. So she's a woman of the tents. She, her, she's in charge of hospitality. And she does quite literally the opposite. Now, many scholars have tried to point out that she breaks at least two of the Ten Commandments. She see, appears to lie, and she appears to murder, And she violates the social rules of her Mideastern culture. However, the Song of Deborah commemorates this as wartime violence. While killing is never preferable, the song tells us that in this case, her actions are clearly the judgment of God on Sisera. Moreover, her actions are proportionate and confined to this one act of judgment. Notice, she doesn't go out and then become the tent peg avenger, (laughs) killing all of God's enemies this way. Listen, God is sovereign over the injustices of evil people. Do you believe that? Like Sisera and his armies and the questionable actions of those who appear to break God's moral law. God is still sovereign even over those who act questionably. 
And this is why Deborah says, listen, God is behind this. God was the one orchestrating this, okay? Look at this passage in Acts 4, 27. It says, for, in fact, this is the early church praying. They say, for, in fact, in the city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles and the people of Israel assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take, to take place. Even the actions of intentional evil or ignorance was predestined by God according to his plan. The Christian rests assured that even sinful actions by sinful people are being orchestrated and they're going according to God's plan in history. And so we take comfort in the fact that our God is sovereign over history and even those who choose a sinful or a questionable path. Number seven, the song contrasts the mother of Israel with the mother of Sisera. That is a big contrast here in the song. Deborah sings, Sisera's mother looked through the window. She peered through the lattice, crying out, why is his chariot so long in coming? Why don't I hear the hoofbeats of his horses? Her wisest princes answer her, she even answers herself. Are they not finding and dividing the spoil, a girl or two for every warrior? The spoil of colored garments for for Sisera, the spoil of an embroidered garment or two for my neck. So in the account, the wealthy, opulent life of Sisera's mother that she had become accustomed to because of his oppression of God's people, because he oppressed them and they weren't free, because he oppressed them and they couldn't conduct their worship and their commerce and raise their fields and sell them in the markets. And so she has gotten wealthy now on the backs of Israel and she, Deborah, depicts her as waiting, longing, and it's a longing unfulfilled. In fact, the entire battle is framed around women. It's framed around their story. Deborah calls herself the mother of Israel whom God raised up to call Barak and the loose confederation of Israeli tribes to defend their nation against Jabin and Sisera's oppression. Sisera's oppression is seen most vividly in his horrific treating, treatment of women. He takes these Jewish young girls and gives one or two to them to each of the enemy combatants who win the victors, victory. And so his mother fully expects him to come back with armloads of plunder and slave women in tow as sex slaves for them. But it's unfulfilled. And here's J.L., who's doing the hard work of being a woman of the tent, mining the tent and being a hospitable woman, but in this case, she becomes a turncoat. She becomes a warrior. And so how ironic it is that the man who treated women as objects is himself slain by a woman with a household object. And the Proverbs elevate women in the ancient world when they wouldn't have been otherwise. Proverbs 1.8 says, Listen, my son, to your father's instruction, and don't reject your mother's teaching. Proverbs 10.1 says, A wise son brings joy to his father, but a foolish son heartaches to his mother. The first commandment, the very first commandment is to honor your father and mother so that it may go well with you, so that you won't die an early death. And I know for me personally, I am so encouraged to see how my wife handles my children, how she manages them, how she is there for them, to lead them in terms of her godliness, in terms of her wisdom. Before I ever have a conversation with them, she's already had it a week early. And they just feel comfortable talking to her. They just feel comfortable spilling their guts and telling her all the gory details of their life. And I love that. I love that because they know she's the real deal and she is a woman of wisdom. And I want to tell you today, if women, if you did not have a mother who was godly and wise, then just be one. Choose to become one. Sons, if you didn't have a mother who was godly and wise... Marry one. And if you do have a mother who is godly and wise, the author of Proverbs says, listen to your mama, boy. (laughs) Listen to mom and dad. Because they've been around the block. They've seen a few things in their time. 
And so the song contrasts the mother of Israel, Deborah, with the mother of Sisera, Canaan, whose lust for ill-gotten gain is on display in the loss. And number eight, lastly, the song anticipates Yahweh's eventual victory over all their enemies. Don't miss this, the last verse of the song. The gods of this world who enslave the Gentile nations in false worship will eventually bow their knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. Chapter 5, verse 31, it says, Lord, may all your enemies perish as Sisera did, but may those who love him be like the rising of the sun in its strength. Make no mistake about it, we are currently in an ongoing battle with these same false gods who have the nations and now our nation in their grip of deception. And Paul tells us in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this darkness, against evil, spiritual forces, and the heavens. And the difference now is that these false gods face the greatest threat to their cause and their existence that they have ever faced. If you take the time to read the armor of God in Ephesians 6, every single piece of that armor has to do with the gospel. It's the belt of truth. It's the helmet of salvation in the gospel. It's the breastplate of Christ's righteousness which he purchased on the cross for us. It's having our feet grounded and rooted in the gospel and wielding the sword of the spirit which is the word of God which is the message of the cross. And I assure you that no matter what the battlefield looks like today, God has already won the victory in Christ and this whole story is moving toward victory in Christ. And until then, we love our fellow humans who are trapped in the grip of deception. We love them, and we show them grace, but we tell them the truth. Listen, Deborah's prayer is not just well-wishing. It ends with a prophecy. God is going to win. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up. Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather freely in this place and lift our praises to you. We thank you that we can be reminded of this powerful song right here in one of the bleakest seasons of Israel's life. And we're reminded that you fulfilled your promises to bring them into the land. And we're also reminded that you're going to fulfill your promise to bring all of your enemies into subjection under your rule and under your glorious, gracious reign. And Father, as a congregation right now, we join our hearts And we pray for those in the grip of deception. We pray for those in our community who are in the grip of worshiping false gods. We pray for those in our nation who are in the grip of worshiping and the tyranny of these false gods. And we pray for their release. We pray that these captives will be set free by the anointing of the Holy Spirit in Jesus and by the gospel that sets them free. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. And we say, amen.